And you can see I'm keeping a lot of real punky wood on this fire. And it's got some moisture to it because I don't want big flames, like I said, but I do want a lot of smoke and I want some heat. And you can start to see that this meat, I just turned it again and it's still soft so it's nowhere near done. But it's starting to get the right color to it and the right consistency of jerky or dried meat. Okay, so back to our discussion here about Nesmic for a minute. One of the things that he talks about in his journal is he talks about, or in his book, he talks about what he calls his ditty bag. And this is very similar to what they call the possibles bag, very similar to what we nowadays call our survival kit. And it was basically his self-contained bag that he described as four inches by six inches that had the things in it that he thought he would need other than his tools in an emergency situation and to facilitate him being able to uh, procure meat. And what he talked about in this kit was he talked about having several different size hooks and he talked about having several gangs of line uh, measuring six yards each in different diameters and different weights from the smallest to things that would catch a 10 pound fish. And he doesn't really talk too much about having things like snare wire, things of that nature, because like I said, Nesmic was not a hunter, he was a fisherman. And where he was at in the Adirondacks fish were very plentiful. So he didn't have to worry too much about procuring meat other than fish. He doesn't talk too much about trapping at all in his book. Um, he talks quite a bit about fishing. Um, the other things that he mentions having in his in his ditty bag or his little survival kit were several different size darning needles. He talked about having some heavy duty thread. He talked about having a match safe. Um, and nowadays I would think that that would, you know, mean a ferro rod to us and some wet fire would be my match safe. I would never trust matches in any situation. Even if they were waterproofed and in a waterproof container, I'd much rather have wet fire and a strike force. But those things weren't available to him in the 1800s, so he had a match safe at his hand all the time. Now he discussed that he had his large uh, butchering type knife attached to the back of this bag and around his neck. So he carried this bag on his person all the time with his emergency essentials inside it. And he discussed a couple of the things that were inside this kit as well, and it's well worth reading this book if you've never seen it. Now he discussed clothing in this book a little bit as far as what he wore, and he talked about wearing basically a flat soled boot, leather boot, and he talked about wearing wool garments, wool hunting shirts like this, and wool trousers. Now, this hunting shirt is plaid, but <coughs> it's very similar in pattern and nature to the other wool hunting shirts that I've worn and made in recent videos. We have found a source for these wool hunting shirts in a green color, very similar to the green army blanket color that we made the one out of in our video. And we are going, they are professionally made. They are not hand sewn, they're machine sewn. But we will be offering them on both my website and canteenshop.com within the next few days. We could not find a good picture of this item. So we're having one sent to me that we can photograph for pictures on our website for you to buy. But they're very similar to the wool blanket shirts we offered a couple years ago. And they'll be somewhere in the $65 range, I believe, if I remember right. But we'll have them before Christmas for purchase. Um, I wanted to go over the story of Nesmic with you a little bit and a little bit of his writings today so that you could look up his book again called Bushcraft and Camping. If you cannot find a copy of his book, let me know on Facebook or by email and I will try to provide a copy of that somewhere on my website for free download because I think it's a very important book. It's provided in many of the research CDs that I sell as well as the Pathfinder system and the Pathfinder Youth System because I think it's that important of a book to be read. So with that said, let's get back to our uh, segment on smoking and jerking deer meat here and we'll look at that some more and we'll talk more about other people who've written uh, books and things of that nature that I think are important for you to read in the near future. I just wanted to share that story with you today while we're spending a few hours out here uh, smoking our meat over the fire. getting a little bit windy out here and it's getting a little bit cold so one of the things that I can do to help myself out to help speed this process up and protect it a little bit is I can build myself a small tripod here and interlock 
a couple branches over top of my grid. that then I can actually get inside my shelter and grab my grass mat out of there and I can actually spread that grass mat over the top of this tripod just like this and that will help keep the wind and the smoke keep the wind off and the smoke in and I'll just have to adjust that to where I have it even. And that's going to build me somewhat of a small smokehouse right there over top of that meat. Okay. Now we need to look at this rack here. See what we got going on here and how this meat's doing. Looks pretty good. We don't want to lose any of it, so we got to be careful. Turn this over again. I can definitely feel the heat. There ain't no, absolutely no question in that. There's plenty of heat under there. Now, because I've got this closed in now, I can let this fire burn down a little bit, and I'm still going to conserve a lot of heat. Now I have to worry about the flames getting up onto my grass mat, which that's okay. I just need to pay closer attention to my fire now, that's all. Keep it spread out so that the flames stay down low. This will help speed the drying process up now that the wind's kicked up and it's chilly. You know, a lot of what I've been doing while I've been out here today smoking this deer is I've been adding to my shelter and just going around adding leaves adding debris shoring everything up and that's part of what you have to do when you have a permanent shelter structure like this you've got to constantly maintain it so while you've got the time that you're sitting here for several hours camp tasks are the things that you need to be doing to pass the time it's gonna be a little while before this meets done I broke a piece open a minute ago there was still some moisture in the middle of it so it's not done yet it's gonna be a little while so I'm just taking this time to go ahead and shore up my camp and work on my gear sharpen my knife sharpen my axe things like that and these are the things that you will want to do while you're waiting on things that take a long period of time like smoking meat well fellas let's get a piece of meat off the back of this rack here and see what she looks like Okay. That's a piece of done meat right there. That thing just cracked open in my hand just like shoe leather. There's no moisture inside there. That's a perfectly done piece of jerky right there. Let's have a taste. Oh man. Woo! Son. Well, that's good. Mm mm. Okay. Now. Let's talk about storing this for travel in the woods. Okay, once we get this meat done, it's smoked and it's now jerky. We don't want to store this in a plastic bag of any kind because it'll collect moisture and it'll mildew and it'll go bad on us. We've got this real fine mesh rag that we used the other day. We made our tallow and stuff that we've been carrying our common man kit. I transferred that over to my kit today. And that's perfect to store this stuff in. And we can just put that right down inside of it. Wrap a couple pieces up and then we'll put a couple more pieces in. And we'll wrap it over the top of that again. And we'll continue to wrap that. And that will give us a breathable cloth that we can store this meat in. And it won't go bad on us on the trail. And this will keep for a long, long period of time. We can put this right in the bottom of our haversack or our backpack, carry it with us. As long as we make sure it doesn't get wet, it'll be good to go. If it does get a little bit damp, 
because it's a breathable fabric, it's going to dry out anyway. And that's what we want. We want to keep it dry. So once we get that wrapped up, then we can just put that in our haversack or in our backpack, like I said, and take it with us on the trail. And we've got probably a pound or a pound and a half of meat there, and that'll last a good two or three days mixed with our other food items. Well, I'm Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School, and I hope you enjoyed this segment today on making uh, jerky in the woods out of deer meat, venison jerky. Uh, took about five and a half hours from the time we started the fire and got our meat on to the time it was finished and ready to go and put into a trail bag. Took about five and a half hours. So it's not something that you're going to do in a quick hurry. But if you noticed, a lot of the things that we've used in the last few videos out here at the spider shelter have been repetitive items that we've used for different things. And that's the key to all of this stuff is to make everything that you use multi-purpose. I thank you for joining me in this video and I thank you for your support and your views. I appreciate your time and I'll be back with another video real soon. Thank you very much.